imaging uh, summit. I mean, uh, there has been a tremendous interest in the imaging right uh, since yesterday's fellow scores, uh, and this is going to be a comprehensive imaging session. I invite the next chairpersons, uh, Dr. T. Rajesh and Ajit uh, Pillai. Uh, both of them, please take our place and uh, we take this uh, session forward. Thank you very much. I just <laughs> good job, man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, good evening, all. Uh, we are starting this uh, imaging summit. Uh, so the first lecture is by Dr. Vijay Kumar. So he'll be uh, talking about the uh, basics revisited. Uh, in CTO. Uh, good evening. Uh, we have listened to a lot of advanced IVS stuff uh, throughout the day. I'm just going through some of the basic stuff in the next eight minutes. To start with IVS catheter, common, some of the common IVS patterns and patterns in anti-grade approach and patterns in the integrated approach. To start with uh, IVS catheters, we have four type of IVS catheters currently available in India, two mechanical systems and two paste array systems. The mechanical systems have high, very high resolution and uh, tip to transducer distance of about 20 to 30 millimeters. In contrast, paste array systems have tip to transducer distance of 2.5 to 10 millimeter distance, and, and, but they are limited by lower resolution. And uh, if you want to use IVAS for your wire handling, it is preferable to use uh, short tip to transducer distance uh, uh, systems like paste array systems. For stent optimization, you can use any of the four systems. And if you want to use IVAS and uh, micro catheter together for IVAS guided wiring, you need an eight French guiding catheter or you have to use two guiding catheters. So IVAS produces uh, cross-sectional images which are similar to histological sections. And uh, the normal vessel by IVS, IVS has a dark lumen. So, so it has a dark lumen with the blood speckles and an IVS catheter. In IVS catheter with the mechanical systems, the wire lies on the side of the IVS catheter. You always see a, uh, so you have a pointer here. So, uh, you always see a wire shadow. In contrast, in paste array systems, the wire passes through the middle of the IVAS catheter. You won't see any wire shadows. And uh, next to it, next to the lumen, you have three-layered architecture, the inner endema, which is a bright structure, followed by media, which is a dark structure, and outer uh, adventitia, again, it is a dark structure. So bright, dark, bright is a normal structure, what you see in a normal lumen. And when the disease is developed, plaque accumulates in the endema, so endema thickening develops. So in a CTO vessel, the intimal, intima means the lumen part is filled with the endemal plaque. So there is no lumen, it is all filled with the plaque. So when you do your revascularization, in, uh, so your wire can lie within the structure of the vessel or it can lie outside the vessel. So inside the vessel, it can be either in the intimal block or in the subintimal space. Subintimal space is nothing but it is your media. So when you do uh, intimal block tracking, your IVAS catheter lies exactly in the middle of the intimal block. When you d uh, go enter the subintimal space, that is the medial space, so the wire movement develop, enlarges the space very easily and it, in addition, it enlarges with the development of the hematoma. So your intimal block collapses and appears as a round structure on one of the sides. Sorry. So this is your intimal block and this is your subintimal space and the divers catheter in the subintimal space. Uh, when your wire end goes outside the vessel architecture, so this is your vessel architecture, when it goes outside, you see the IVAS catheter lying in the extravascular space. And uh, when you cross the occlusion and enter the true distal lumen, so it can be either inside the lumen or your, or your wire can be in the subintimal space. 
So here, inside the lumen is called true lumen. When you enter the subendimal space, it is called uh, false lumen. So how do you identify it? True lumen will have three layers architecture, and false lumen will have a single layer structure. Here, the false lumen is nothing but a media. You call it as a subendimal space in the occluded segment. You call it as a, a false lumen in the occlusion uh, by segment beyond the occlusion. So various varieties of vascular injury is observed during CTO PCI. The common injury patterns are first one is called intramedial hematoma. Intramedial hematoma is nothing but accumulation of blood in the medial space that appear as a hyperechoic homogeneous crescent shaped structure that is compressing your true lumen. And the second pattern is called perivascular hematoma. Perivascular hematoma is nothing but accumulation of blood outside the vessel architecture and uh, it is again appears as a crescent shaped hyperechoic homogeneous structure that occupies the space outside the vessel wall. The third pattern you observe is called as a perivascular blood speckles. Perivascular blood speckles is nothing but blood speckles that this hyperechoic structure outside the vessel wall and in addition you see hypoechoic spaces these are all contrast so this is a mixture of contrast and rbcs so these are the three patterns uh, three injury patterns you observe during cto pci so when you do anti grade pci and if you have a blend stump with a side branch shootable side branch you can easily identify the proximal entry zone that is a proximal cap by doing the side branch iris pullback so when you do pullback so this is an area so that is where you see the indimal plaque of the main vessel that is where you have to enter your other thing so this is where your proximal cap that is so when you come back from the side branch when you see the indimal plaque of the main vessel that is your proximal cap for the successful procedure, you have, your wire has to pass through the middle of the intimal block that has, has been shown in the last case uh, elegantly. So when you do anti-grade uh, intimal plaque tracking, that means you are passing through the through the intimal plaque throughout and enters the true lumen distally. So this is how it appears when if intimal plaque tracking happens. Ivers catheter passes through the middle of the plaque throughout and enters the true lumen distally. So when you do anti-grade dissection re-entry, the anti-wire and the IVS catheter enters the intimal block, then enters the subindimal space and enters into the true lumen distally, which is either achieved by using a strong wire or by using a stingray balloon. So here, this is in the intimal space, here it is in the subindimal space, and here it is in the true lumen. So it, when you do a, ret a retrograde approach, reverse card is a common modality of a, wire crossing. Reverse cast is nothing but uh, uh, connecting spaces to facilitate uh, retrograde wire crossing. You observe four patterns. It is difficult to, it is very important to understand uh, wire positions inside the vessel wall to do optimal reverse cart. So here the anti-grade wire is, contains your IVS catheter and retrograde wire appears as a bright spot with the shadowing. So this is your retrograde wire and anti-grade wire is uh, but the IVAS catheter is on your anti-grade wire. So this is the first pattern and the most favorable pattern where you have your anti-grade wire and the retrograde wire both in the subindimal space. So this is when you are, it is very easy to connect uh, both the wires with the balloon dilatation. Uh, this is a second pattern where you have both your anti-grade wire and the retrograde wire both in the indimal space. So, so this is a second pattern observed. Again, it is uh, even though it is not as easy as the first pattern, is again it is uh, possible for by your balloon dilatation to connect uh, these wires and uh, achieve retrograde wire crossing. So this is a third pattern where your anti-grade wire is in the indimal space and the retrograde wire is in the subindimal space. Here. It is uh, much more difficult to comparing to the first two patterns. Again, by using a very big balloon, you will be able to connect it to these two paces. And uh, this is the uh, last and the most uh, unfavorable pattern where you have your anti-grade wire in the subindimal space and a retrograde wire in the indimal space. It is uh, almost impossible to connect it these two spaces. So you have to achieve either one of the first two patterns to achieve anti-retrograde wire crossing. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Dr. Vijay, for the wonderful lecture. Now we'll invite uh, Dr. Kirti Punamia to talk about implications of a large hematoma in IWAS.
Dr. Kirti is here. Great. So large intramural hematomas, um, the IVAS findings and implications. So what is an intramural hematoma? I think Vijay very eloquently has described what a hematoma is. It's an accumulation. If you look at it, it's the 2002 definition from one of the largest papers that talked about intravascular ultrasound recognition of hematomas in the perivascular space. And this was from uh, uh, Mahiro uh, from the US. Um, the accumulation of blood within the medial space displacing the internal elastic membrane inwards and the external elastic membrane outwards with or without an identifier entry and exit point in that space. And that is the definition. And as you can see, uh, could I have a pointer as well? Uh, great. You can see that there's this big crescentric shaped uh, uh, shadow that you can see outside the vessel which represents the uh, hematoma. This is the paper where they studied 900 patients, and this is our first definitions of intramural hematomas. How did it affect our practice? And I wanted to show it to you with a case, uh, one of our cases. This was a long segment RCSCTO that was attempted and was abandoned because the pa a, a subintimal space was entered, and you can see in the last image to your right that there was a little bit of a perforation, kind of a contained perforation with a hematoma extending into the perivascular space seeing a scene on the anti-grade angiography. Once the procedure was abandoned, um, this patient was brought in back three months later, and that's when um, I was involved. Uh, this was the uh, simultaneous angiography, and you can see it's a fairly long segment. What we did was to make the long story short, we got the retrograde wires in, and you can see that we'd got anti-grade purchase into the PDA um, using a, a retrograde approach. Um, the IVIS image is to follow. And you can, if you look at the IVIS, this is the angiography, a very gentle angiography done, and you can see on the angiography that there's a little bit of a branch, which you can see the RE branch was evident there. When you look at the images, you can start with this image right here, which is the distal most image. You can see that it's right there. You can see the external elastic lamina, I mean the media all around. The probe is in the center, and you can see that the branch opens into this probe, into, this, in, into the space. This confirms an intimal or luminal space or position of the catheter. See what happens when you go down you can see that there's an eccentric plaque. It maintains, and you can still see the black halo of the media around the vessel. And you can see perforators, and you can see the wire shadow. What happens in between there is there is suddenly, if you come onto the images right over here, you can see that suddenly you have the probe in the center, and you can see this dark shadow all pushed to one side. When you go up these images, you can see that there's a large eccentric hematoma, which you can see right from 4 o'clock all the way down to 7 o'clock, right here. And this continues all the way to the very top here, and you can see that we are back into the true lumen here, and you can see that there's a good branch coming into the true lumen where the catheter is. So what exactly happened in this patient? We entered, we, we were in the lumen. At some point, we deviated from the lumen into the subintimal space, and you can see that the true lumen lays in the, right at the side here. And this is a classic image of the true lumen, and we outside into the false passage. We re-enter, and then we are back into true lumen. So it's true lumen, false lumen, and true lumen. Now, let us look at where we exited, and therefore, you need to look at some of the movies, because still images may not tell you the story. The idea for you is to concentrate on the external elastic lamina or the media. And if your wires are outside of the media, if your wires are within the medial space, then you're OK. But if your wires have gone outside the medial space, then you have exited the true lumen. And this video should tell you that. If you see the intimal space is defined by this media, and you can see my wire is outside the media. When the branch comes in, my wire should have been in this top space. It is in the bottom space. 
So somewhere at the branching point, when I was penetrating, even though we used a retrograde approach, what we did was we re-entered at that point from a false lumen back into the true lumen distally, and therefore, while we were in the PDA, we were in the true lumen, but before the crooks all the way up to the RV branch, we were subintimal. Because the subintimal had a hematoma, what we ended up doing is we laid a stent inadvertently uh, into the subintimal space in that area, which was filled with thrombus. And what happened was we excluded, this was, this was the angio. Not a great picture, these arteries don't stay well. We know we'd made a mistake. Two, three things, we'd oversized the stent and thereby milk the hematomas distally, that you can see that. Through an entry point distally, we might have squeezed thrombus into the true lumen proximally, which is what we saw, and we had to put in a stent all the way to the ostium. And the long segment seems in the subintimal path based on our iris. These are things that we can learn, and sometimes these learnings are in the hindsight. This is another case, an example of, uh, how, inter how, of how we create these hematomas when in our normal practice. And to highlight that is a 76-year-old infarct, which happened in 2014. He had an angiography, and the operator at that time found that he had an inferior wall MI, so he, he found this critical narrowing here and an extremely critical calcified stenosis of the osteal LAD. An angioplasty was performed with the DS implantation of the RCA, and a balloon was attempted, and can you see a balloon struggled to go in, and a 2 balloon didn't do, so 1.5 dilated at high pressures, and what happened was this large dissection of the normal part of the artery kicked and tearing up the media, and an ex like a hematoma, which is there, and you can see that the true lumen is preserved on the other side, but is very compromised because of this. Even though the flow was okay, the patient settled down, but he subsequently, in 2016, he kind of progressed into LV dysfunction and almost like a cardiogenic shock. This was his angio. The LED showed a heavily calcified lesion, but you can see that there is what appears like a, a good lumen, but this is all false lumen because the true lumen lies hidden inside it, and the angiography very typically cannot show the true lumen, and sometimes we, we, are kind of, we, are, we mistake these false lumen for the actual true lumen and miss out the actual stenosis. Um, this patient was, an, uh, 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 we went ahead with, uh, with wiring this, and you can see obviously that it took us a while to get the wire into the true lumen through that. Uh, in view of the last uh, uh, previous pictures and the uh, inability of the patient to get, uh, to get, of the operator to get balloons in, we did a rotational anthracotomy and then followed that with an IVUS image, and you can see that the distal IVUS image shows an eccentric plaque which is calcified. And there you can see the green is the true lumen, and there's a huge space that was created, which was that space which was parallel to the LED, which was shadowing around it and obscuring the true lumen. And you can see that this is, this is from a previous intramural hematoma. So this is what happens in its natural history when you leave it along. This was our final result, and this patient's done well. We got an angiographic follow-up two years later and is doing okay. The Japanese described it very eloquently and one of the issues is this, this is a patient who, after you can see that there is a spontaneous dissection with, and when you look at the IVUS, you don't see any intimal disease. But you see a compromised lumen which has been pressed upon by something from the perivascular space which looks like a hematoma. And what did this operator do? Do nothing. He kept him on uh, medical management, and this is what happens three months later because the hematoma gets absorbed and once the hematoma is absorbed, you realize that the space is kind of restructured. So a lot of these hematomas may heal. So if the patient is without symptoms, and if the intima is OK, and there is no exit or breach of the intima, then I think that some of these hematomas can be left alone, treated medically, and they will absorb to heal well with a good vascular lumen. This is what happens to some of those patients, and this is a lady who underwent an angiography in my lab for evaluation of shortness of breath. And you can see the experience of choking. The CT coronary angiography two years ago showed a soft plaque in the proximal LED with no significant luminal narrowing, and the nuclear imaging then was negative for inducible ischemia. 
This is the kind of anatomy we saw. We saw this little aneurysm right at the mouth of the uh, LAD and a critical lesion, at what looked angiographically 70% in the ostium. Anyway, the FFR was negative, so we left that circumflex alone. The LAD FFR was negative, so it wasn't functional, but we went and did an imaging. And what did we find in the imaging? The left main showed, uh, the, 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 this is the images that you can see. This is the LAD distally, and it looked good. The red is the intimal lining, the blue is the uh, the external elastic lamina or the media. And you can see that as you come in over here, this is interesting. You can see that there is an echolucent shadow going across into the lumen, which is marked by these red arrows, and that is the media. That means you have the true lumen on one side over here, which appears compressed, then you have the media, and then you have a separation of the adventitia and the external elastic lamina right across over here, which is what would have been a hematoma. So what had happened to this lady might have been an int a spontaneous intramural hematoma as an acute coronary syndrome two years ago. And at that stage, that, that ruptured into the lumen and the hematoma emptied out into the lumen, leaving behind that whole space which now looks like what is a pseudoaneurysm which is there. Now, most of these pseudoaneurysms will do well, and if the lumen and what we get guided by is if the FFR in these values are good, and if the minimal luminal area of the true lumen represents what would be potently equivalent to a normal FFR, then I think these can be left alone on medical therapy and treated well. This patient, incidentally, had a left main, uh, angiographic uh, left main, which was blocked, and we found that the MLA was around 6.2 there, and we've left it on medical management. What does this complex lesion represent in the proximal LAD? It very much mimics, and it looks like a, a pseudoaneurysm, or it looks like an aneurysm, or it looks like what could be a hematoma. But sometimes when you do these IVUS images, you realize, though I'm, pardon me for those dark images, but, if, uh, but believe me when I tell you that if you look at this, this entire thing is happening. You can see the tone intima right here and this necrotic plaque. But whatever is happening in these images is happening within the media. The media surrounds the entire event. And when the media surrounds the ev entire event, these are ulcerated plaques, and these are not hematomas. So when it is the entire event, event is happening within the medial space, you're looking at an ulcerated plaque. When you see that the media is dividing the two spaces with it in the center, like I showed in the previous view, then you're looking at an intramural hematoma. And to make this representation, here is a cartoon which actually tells you that the vessel architecture is the red line, which is the media, and you can see that. And you can see that the periva is the intramural hematoma. This is the hematoma. This is an ulcerated plaque because the media is all around, and you can see that the orange arrows inside represent a cavity within the vessel space with a ruptured or a breached intima, which is an ulcerated plaque, and it, sometimes one can be confused in doing a pullback. And so you have to then look at the video playback, and when you look at these videos as they come along, you'll be able to appreciate this, and you can appreciate the ulcerated plaque very different from an intramural hematoma, and that's important. Again, from Japan, they've taught us that in this patient who had a spontaneous dissection with a hematoma and compromised lumen in the LAD, the operator on the IVUS found a huge intramural hematoma, and what he did was he sized the artery based on the IVUS, went in with a cutting balloon, and nudged it. So what he did was, IVUS guided, controlled fenestration or disruption of this junction of the media in between or the, or the membrane in between, and therefore you empty the contents of the hematoma into the true lumen to get washed out. What happens is clearly shown on OCT where you can see the breach of this with a cutting balloon, and so you see this shagged lumen. One would wonder, what do you do with them? And sometimes you'd be tempted to want to stent them. Don't stent them. Don't stent them. Because what happens is, if you were to stent them, you would stent them based on the normal size. And when eventually the hematoma resolves, you will find that there is these struts right in the center with an absorbed hematoma, and they'd be hanging in the middle of the lumen. And so it looked like a malapose stent at the end. So don't stent them, because if you do a six-month follow-up, you will feel that these hematoma, these arteries have healed very well. The 
It, the idea is if the flow is good, do not get seduced into putting metal in there for this one reason, and that's important. I want to end there because I do, we could go on for long, but these are the important issues. That inter, intramural hematomas are visualized by IVIS and OCTA likewise, and imaging becomes the core of understanding what we have and how we treat these. They are most likely to be confused with ulcerated plaques and so, the operator needs to be careful. The ulcerated plaque necessarily needs to be stented and stabilized. The hematomas don't need that. They often will compromise the true lumen and may heal spontaneously or over a period of time develop a pseudoaneurysm like I've shown both those cases. The IVUS controlled penetration of intramural hematomas using a cutting balloon is probably the way to go. We need to have more data, but it is the best way to preserve the lumen long term. Stent expansion may squeeze the intramural hematomas proximally or distally compromising lumen, and therefore, in my experience, that sizing has to be critical when we find intramural hematomas, and sometimes overexpansion, pardon my spelling over there, but overexpansion may be associated with slow flows, and underexpansion may result in delayed malaposition following absorption of these hematomas, and that's not acceptable either. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Dr. Kirti. Uh, we'll allow a couple of questions. I have one. Uh, just like dissections and other intimal issues, um, do you have any um, suggestions in terms of quantifying the um, hematoma? Largely we go by the flow, like if you have a flow compromising hematomas, we end up aspirating it, we end up stenting it. Uh, in the context of CT, was, because obviously you have a plaque inside, you end up stenting it. But in cases like you have shown like spontaneous coronary artery dissections with hematomas, some of them do, do heal without any, any residual left. Some of them end up having pseudoaneurysms. So is there any uh, paper which addresses quantifying these hematomas? We have in your so the only question. paper that I actually read about a group of cases was that which imaged those hematomas and defined the appearances and the incidences and prevalences in PCI and around coronary atherosclerosis spontaneously. There is no paper which defines us how to treat intramural hematomas, but when you look up, you'll see scores and scores of case reports of what various people have done for this. I think your question was more, how do you quantify it? So rather than quantifying the hematoma per se, what you need to know is its influence on the lumen, because that is what is relevant to that patient, because that is going to compromise the blood flow. I think two things which are relevant in this is how compromised is the true lumen to kind of cause ischemia peripherally. And second important issue is whether there is a disruption of the intima or an entry point within that space which probably needs to be stabilized to make sure it doesn't worsen and then destroy true lumen later. I think these are the important issues. I think either way, I think the treatment may not necessarily be a stent because a stent, as we showed you, I mean, multiple examples, that putting in stents can actually displace it further and sometimes cause problems later on. So we really don't know what to do, but at the present time, when we don't know what to do, you should do little, actually. Yeah. A very elegant description of intramural hematoma. The second case which you described uh, was about a rotablation, a patient who had previously intramural hematoma. How mm -hmm. safe is a rotablation? In, uh, How safe is it to do a rotablator in this presence? Yeah, yeah. Uh, when you know that you've had a space created a while ago and there is nothing acute about it, and what is acute is that if I have to go and do the intervention again, then I would have to kind of re, I mean, I have to go back and review what, what why did the f operator two years ago fail? He failed because he did not do a rotoblader. So it's okay. When I, when I see these kind of cases time and again, and we've got now scores of cases like this, we've just given a blind eye to these spaces around the artery and gone and done rotobladers to the true lumen and stented it based on the uh, uh, size beyond and before. Would a cutting balloon would have been more appropriate in that situation? Sorry, cutting, say that again. A cutting balloon in that situation. 
a cutting balloon. Yeah. A cutting balloon should be deliverable. In most of these patients, that operator couldn't put in a two millimeter balloon instead. We had to actually use a tornus to exchange for a rotavia and then do a rotational atherectomy. Putting a cutting balloon in these patients would be riff because if you try to push it, the cutting balloon quickly loses its profile once it's inflated. And if you pushed it beyond, sometimes it would be difficult to pull that high profile balloon back and you would shear your blades off. So I don't recommend you shove cutting balloons against resistance. I have, I have in my lab, I have a lower threshold to start off and do a rotoblader. Thank you, Dr. Kirti. A wonderful Thank lecture. Uh, may I request the next speaker, Yuji Hamasaki. Um, his topic is IVAS guided penetration technique, how to shorten the learning curve. Dr. Hamasaki, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'd like to uh, talk about uh, how to shorten the learning curve of uh, IVAS guided penetration technique. And the uh, role of uh, IVAS uh, guided penetration in situ PCI is in two roles. Uh, one is to uh, get the entry point of no stamp CTO with side branch, and uh, the other is uh, one IVAS guided rewiring. Uh, to shorten the uh, learning curve, uh, first point is uh, where penetration should be started. And uh, another point is uh, how to decide the direction of uh, penetration. Uh, first, I'd like to about uh, where penetration should be started. Uh, first, uh, no stamp CTO with a side branch. Uh, this is a five us findings of no stamp CTO with side branch. Uh, as you know, in this situation, we perform the IVAS from a side branch, and uh, as you can see, uh, we can see the entry point clearly by IVAS, uh, just like this, so of course, uh, we perform uh, uh, wiring around us here. And uh, this is a uh, uh, IVAS guided rewiring. Of course, IVAS guided rewiring is used after failed anti-grade wiring. So, anti-grade, uh, failed anti-grade wiring made a, a sub-intimal space like this. And uh, as you know, uh, after failed anti-grade wiring, sub-intimal space is getting larger, easier, just like this. And the uh, uh, intimal plaque is getting smaller, like this. This is a typical IVAS findings of failed anti-grade wiring. IVAS guided rewiring is not re-entry method, so IVAS guided rewiring is, perform, is not performed from uh, Sub-intimal space to intimal space. Penetration from sub-intimal space to intimal plaque is difficult, almost impossible. If we can do that, all CTO PCI is very easy. We can uh, not uh, do that. CTO PCI is always difficult. And this slide showed how to perform IVAS guided rewiring. Rewiring must be done in intimal plug to advance guide wire into intimal plug. So role of IVAS is to identify entry point of first guide wire to subintimal space. This is the entry point. In this scheme, uh, this is an entry point to sub-intimal space. Uh, this is an entry point. So, rewiring start at the proximal site of this entry point based on IVAS findings. So, rewiring point of IVAS guided wiring is here. It is very important point to perform uh, IVAS guided rewiring. So next point, how to decide direction of uh, penetration. In this point, uh, there is a two method. 
One is a by IBUS image. This slide shows the wiring under the IBUS image for non-stamp CTO with a side branch. As you can see, uh, CTO is a uh, true lumen is here. So, ideal position of chip of guide wire is here. So, if guide wire is there, by counterclockwise rotation, guide wire can be moved from here to here. When guide wire is here, by clockwise rotation, guide wire can be moved to from here to here. This slide shows the wiring under IBUS image in IBUS guided rewiring. First, at distal side of entry point into subintimal space, here, location of plaque is confirmed by IBUS findings. Plaque in this scheme, uh, plaque is here. After that, at the proximal site of re-entry point into subintimal space, wiring starts. And the wiring is, guide wire is advanced to the direction of plug at the distal site of entry point into subintimal space. So, in this scheme, plug is here, so guide wire is advanced toward this direction. When plug is here, guide wire should be advanced toward here. When plug is here, guide wire should be advanced toward here. Next method is a bifluoroscopic image. In this uh, method, uh, two methods exist. One is the relation between IBUS and the guide wire and the use of a branch. So, and this, uh, two, uh, this method, uh, to use this method, to understand from where IBUS image is seen by horoscopy is very important. So this slide, show, uh, this slide showed how to understand from where IBUS image is seen by horoscope. And in use of a Thermo IBUS and a Boston IBUS, we can see the guide wire uh, used for introducing IBUS on IBUS image, just like this. So, on fluoroscopic image, IBUS is upper side and the guide wire is lower side. It means we see the vessel from this angle on the fluoros image. When guide wire is upper side and the IBUS is lower side, it means we see the vessel from this side on floral image. When guide wire and IBUS are overlapped, there is a two possibility from here to here. So in such a situation, we perform a clockwise rotation or counter-clockwise rotation. So, uh, after clockwise rotation, IBUS is upper side and uh, lower side is a guide wire. In this situation, we see the vessel from here and uh, another pattern is from here. In use of a volcano eagle eye, 
。On Ivas image, we can not see the guide wire、uh, used for introducing Ivas. So, in such situation, we have to insert it. Other guide wire. After that, method is the same as the previous pattern. Let me show you one case. This case is a LCX CTO. From the angiogram, entry point is unclear. As you can see, entry point is unclear. RCA gives a good collateral to a distal part. So, in this case,、uh, we perform a CT、uh, before a PCI. As you can see, CT showed a CTO located at,、uh, beyond、uh, branches, two branches. So, PCI, of course, PCI、uh, start with the IBAS guidance.、Uh, guide wire is inserted into a side branch, and、uh, IBAS、uh, from a side branch is used. This is the IBAS image. This is a CX occluded、uh, main branch, and a side branch, small side branch, c o m e here. From three o'clock. And、uh, this is a LED. Come to uh, from uh, six, uh, two o'clock. So, in this、uh, fluoroscopy, as you can see, guide wire and、uh, IBUS catheter. Uh, completely overlapped. It means we see the IBUS、uh, from here or from here on a、uh, uh, fluoroscopy. And the side branch、uh, c o m e from、uh, 3 o'clock and the LED c o m e from、uh, 2 o'clock. So it means uh, on a、uh, fluoroscopy,、uh, side branch. Branched to upper side and、uh, LED also branched toward the upper side. So it means we see the vessel from here on this angle. So LCX is here. So, we have to、uh, advance the guide wire this direction. So, from this angle, it is very difficult、uh, to advance this angle. So, we rotated rotation, and、uh, from here to here is performed. And the、uh, best view、uh, of this case is the、uh, aerial cranial.、So, Uh, next, uh, I perform a wiring uh, using a、uh, real cranial view. As you can see, we see the, from a this angle. So, guide wire is、uh, upper side on fluoroscopy, and、uh, IBUS is、uh, lower side. Just like this. So CX is here. So guide wire is advanced to a lower side of IBUS. CX is here. So we see the vessel、uh, from here. After guide wire is advanced, as you can see on the IBUS, we can see the、uh, guide wire. Advancing into a LCX.
After that, guide wire is advanced gradually. Uh, finally, we can get the uh, good recanalization. So, uh, I'd like to summarize my presentation. IBAS guide penetration is an useful uh, method in following the situation of CTO PCI. No stamp CTO and IBAS guide rewiring. To IBAS guide penetration eff effectively, following technique is essential. Uh, wiring and uh, IBAS image. Understand from where IBAS image is seen by fluoroscopy using a relation between IBAS and the guide wire and the branches. Thank you for your attention. Uh, Dr. Hamasaki, excellent lecture. Um, uh, I have one question. Uh, you said uh, um, we need to rotate clockwise and anti-clockwise if uh, the wire is not seen at the Navifocus in Boston. So, in a given case, you decide how you decide to rotate clockwise or anti-clockwise. You understand my question? Mm -hmm. When you don't see the wire, mm. you rotate clockwise yes. Yes, or yes. anti-clockwise. Yes, yes. To see which angle you want to penetrate the wire. Understand? Uh, of course, it depends on uh, uh, vessel position. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you try both and then decide. Yeah, 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 yeah. One side is uh, enough. Fine, but then how will you decide it's clockwise or anti-clockwise? Of course, of course. Uh, initially, we use a LAO, LAO side, yeah. and uh, we cannot uh, uh, move more yeah. uh, counter-clock side. Okay. So, in such a situation, we have to use a clockwise. <laughs> clockwise size. So it depends on the vessel position. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Great. Thank you, Dr. Hamasaki. Very well uh, elucidated lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, excellent lecture. Thanks once again. Um, Dr. Nasu is still operating, so that lecture we have to skip. Uh, so we'll go to the next one, which is again by Vijay. Um, new frontiers in IBS technology. Please, Vijay. Uh, good evening. Um, so the last, this talk is about uh, the newer frontiers in imaging technology. The newer frontiers have been come with the aim of resolving the shortcomings of the existing imaging modalities by either introduction of new technology or by refining or combining the existing modalities. Few are already in clinical use and others are in pipeline. Uh, we have angiographic roadmap for endovascular procedures for a long time and it was not feasible earlier because the coronaries constantly move during angiography. However, this uh, uh, technology has been recently introduced for clinical use called Dynamic Coronary Roadmap. So this is how it works. The angiographic images are taken and earlier it can be superimposed on the live fluoroscopic images. So that is called Dynamic Coronary Roadmap. So even though it is very useful for real-time wire position, wire handling, or your balloon positioning, or stent positioning, and uh, intervention like uh, left main intervention or complex bifurcation interventions. So it is not currently useful for CTO procedures because the current technology requires inject ve whole vessel opacification from one direction. So it has to opacify by contrast injection in one direction and all the wire manipulations are stent positioning, everything has to be done in a single view. So then only the, you can use this image. So in CTO, you'll be injecting in two directions because the vessel will be opacified in two directions and you always need orthogonal views. So we maybe uh, get, uh, if you get this technology for your CTO procedures, so you don't have to take uh, retrograde injections all the time. So maybe in near future, you'll be getting this same modality for CTO applications too. 
And uh, the second innovation is uh, co-registration of CT images with uh, angiography. We all know in CTO lesions, CT scan, CT imaging provides valuable information on vessel course, curvatures, and the plaque composition. So all this information is very useful when you do a complex CTO intervention. Here you can just see that this is an, a long LED CTO, and uh, this is a co-registered image here. So you can just see this blue uh, green marking is the actual vessel course that has been identified with the CT. And uh, if you see here, uh, again, the yellow dots are your calcium distribution. So you get uh, full information about the vessel course and the distribution of the calcium. So with this information, so there is successful recanalization of this long segment LED lesion. Again, there is a limitation with this technology. The superimposition of the images only feasible with static images rather than dynamic images. <coughs> and uh, uh, this is uh, Ivers catheter that has been uh, discussed uh, in the last lecture. So this is a Navifocus Ivers. It has been designed by one of the uh, Japanese operator, uh, Dr. Wakamura, who was here in, during the morning course. <coughs> so this Ivers catheter is different from the routine Ivers catheters. It has a uh, short, uh, I already told you in the last lecture, so for IVAS guided wiring, you need a catheter with a short tip to Can you give this? Please give a pointer to Dr. Vijay. Pointer. So, you need to have short tip to transducer distance. So it is about nine millimeters uh, in this catheter and a very low profile, 2.5 French. So it doesn't produce much vessel wall damage when you put into the false lumen. And it has a double monorail design. You can just see a short monorail here and a long monorail. So that gives the catheter as a better pushability. Uh, and this wire position is eccentric. So you don't have to use the second wire that Dr. Hamasaki described it nicely. So you can get this overlap images and the separation images very easily with a single wire inside because this IVAS catheter serves as an additional marker. And the other technology that has been there for quite some time, as back as in 2009 that has been introduced, but so far it is not into clinical use. So this catheter, has uh, this IVAS cat this catheter has an IVAS transducer in the tip, so that produces the image conical images of the vessel structure in front. So it can easily differentiate between uh, the vessel wall and the indimal plaque. And in addition, it gives radio frequency energy, so that helps in revascularization. So it serves uh, both as an imaging catheter and produces radio frequency energy that produce that results in revascularization of the uh, indimal block ahead. So this catheter, though it has been there in uh, for a long time, it is not yet to yet be introduced into the clinical practice. And the third IVAS catheter, high definition IVAS catheter, uh, three, four companies have been producing this catheters, only one into the clinical practice, that is a HD IVAS from the assist. So this produces very high resolution images. Images are somewhere between OCT and the routine IVAS catheter. And without compromising the depth penetration capacities of the current IVAS modalities. In addition, you can do a rapid pullback. You can achieve a pullback speed of about 10 millimeters per second. And for getting clear, clear images, you can either in, inject contrast or saline. It is, works exactly like a OCT catheter, but it produces more depth penetration and an image quality somewhere between IVAS and OCT. And uh, moving to the next modality is this uh, uh, IVAS co-registration with angiographic images. So this IVAS co-registration gives you cross-sectional images, longitudinal IVAS images, along with angiographic images. So you can exactly correlate the IVAS abnormalities on the angiographic images. And in addition, you can precisely identify the stent landing zones. 
uh, so you can exactly position the stent based on the IVS and angiographic findings. A study has shown that uh, geographic miss is about 60% in routine angiographic guided PCI. So when you use this co-registration, your geographic miss is virtually eliminated. And in addition, so when you have, once you have done your stenting, so this IVS images and this angiogram, with this IVS images, you can exactly locate uh, the areas of malposition and under expansion, so that can, you can easily address uh, based on angiography. So, the same co-registration is available currently with uh, optical coherence tomography also. So it also gives all the information that already I told you for IVAS. In addition, it gives something called Lumen Profile. This Lumen Profile, it gets all the information from the 3D reconstructed images. So you get exact mean Lumen diameter and vessel areas frame by frame. So each frame, you get an accurate measurement, automatic measurement of lumen areas and average lumen diameter. In addition, whatever bookmarks you do on the longitudinal image, so that is automatically get transferred into your angiographic images. So in exactly, you can mark the landing zones and you can also identify areas of uh, minimum lumen area and calcium, everything are both angiographically and with OCT images. So in addition, it gives a variety of three-dimensional images that help in different stages of your PCA optimization. And uh, this is uh, metallic stent optimization that is available with the uh, current generation OCT machines. This automatically measures the molar position, dist automatically identify the stent sets and measure the molar position at distance. You can just see this, uh, this dots are all automatic identification of stent sets and it also automatically measure the molar position distance and marks both on the OCT images and, and angiographic images. So you can just identify those places and put your balloon and uh, optimize the stent. And in addition, it has a 3D bifurcation option. So this automatically locate your side branches. These markings are your side branches. And it gives something called Carina view. The Carina view gives optimal view of your side branch ostium. So by doing a main branch pullback, you get an optimal information about the side branch. In addition, once you have done your st provisional stenting in a bifurcation, and this also helps in entering the exact distal cell. And uh, uh, with this three-dimensional uh, OCT imaging, because you all know OCT, uh, the light penetrates through the calcium, and you can identify both the leading and the trailing edges of the your calcium. So with this, it, is free, it will be feasible in near future to get the 3D rendered images of your calcium. So if you get the similar images, it is very easy to plan for your interventional procedures in calcified lesions. And uh, this is another modality in pipeline. So this is called micro OCT. It produces images with a four micron resolution. It is almost similar to your histological sections. So once this comes, you can just uh, image even your endothelization. And the last part is the fusion imaging. We saw multiple imaging modalities. Each has its advantages and disadvantages. Suppose if you take IVAS, it has a depth penetration capabilities, but it is uh, resolution is poor. If you take OCT, it has a very high resolution, but a poor depth penetration. If you take NIRS, that is a near infrared spectroscopy, it uh, optimally identifies lip lipid-rich plaque, but it doesn't give any anatomical information. So if you combine the different modalities, so you're combining the advantages of uh, different modalities. Uh, this is a combination of uh, uh, combination of IVAS and OCT in a single catheter. You can do both imaging. So it combines advantages of uh, uh, this thing, what is OCT, which gives more information about lumen. Uh, it helps in identifying uh, uh, erosion or plaque rupture or intraluminal mass, thrombus, everything easily identified with OCT. And if you want to do a plaque measurement, plaque burden, 
and if you want to see behind the plaque, uh, and if you want to see behind your lipid-rich plaque, so IVAS helps in all these areas. So it is combining the advantages of both IVAS and OCT. And this is a combination of NIRS and IVAS. IVAS gives you an anatomical information, and NIRS gives you a uh, information about the plaque composition. It is particularly useful in identifying the lipid-rich plaques that is usually appears as a yellow plaque. So this yellow plaque is our lipid-rich plaque. So it is an advantage. So here we are combining these advantages of uh, anatomical imaging with uh, uh, chemical composition together. So this is already available for clinical use. And here we are con combining OCT with near-infrared imaging, again high resolution uh, anatomical image along with the plaque recognition capabilities of near-infrared imaging. And uh, this is a combination of OCT and fluorescence. OCT gives anatomical information. Fluorescence gives information about fibrin deposition and inflammatory activity. So particularly it will be helpful in patients who have uh, uh, means vulnerable plaque and in patients who develop uh, uh, thrombin deposit, uh, thrombus deposition over your stent struts. And uh, even uh, it has been proposed uh, in, in preclinical studies, it is feasible to combine the capabilities of IVAS, OCT and near-infrared imaging. And uh, the, some studies have shown that it is even feasible to combine CT images uh, with IVAS and near infrared imaging. So it gets uh, longitudinal, uh, means uh, three-dimensional information from your uh, CT and uh, uh, plaque characterization of an NIRS and another anatomical information from IVAS. And uh, lastly, uh, it may be feasible to get a functional information from three-dimensional OCT because you get a volumetric information. Easily you can calculate your flow rates and uh, from the flow rates and the lumen areas, it will be able to uh, uh, accurately get information about the pressure drop across the stenosis. So once you get the pressure drop across the stenosis, it, is, it will be feasible to calculate your FFR. It is uh, almost similar to what you get with the CT imaging. So this completes the presentation. So the newer modalities uh, all aim at uh, Im improving our understanding and facilitating the procedure and removing all the ambiguity associated with the current generation imaging. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I just prepared for eight minutes. I have been asked to prolong for 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, so this much only I could do it. Thank you. Uh, it was an excellent lecture, Vijay. Congratulations. And um, any questions from the floor? Uh, we are just uh, on time for the dinner symposium. So um, thank you very much. Uh, again, congratulations for the wonderful lecture. So um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have the Imaging Summit uh, finishes here.